Hi there. We are Jim and Jonna Schuster, and this is a glimpse into our world. Conversations from our living room. Unscripted, without agenda, prompted by the Holy Spirit. And usually over coffee. About what God is saying to us right now. No promises on what you'll get. Rev bombs, rants, breakthroughs, victories. It's all fair game. But we hope it's a place of encountering the depths of the Lord together. So come explore with us here on the Catholic Revival Ministries podcast. For the past month or so, there's been kind of this continual theme of things that God has been drawing to my attention. And the general subject is basically the unique value that every human being carries in them and the particular way that each person manifests or displays the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And there's a really beautiful quote that I just ran across yesterday. This Mm -hmm. just keeps coming up like, Certain people are talking about it and they keep landing in my life and I keep getting excited every time I see this. But this particular quote says, within each human heart, the father has hidden a key that unlocks a piece of his glory. Mm. Humanity are key holders of the divine. Mm. And I love that. That's that's awesome. Preston Hornbeck, um, who's with Cageless Birds down in Mm. North Carolina. Oh, cool. And so this thought has just been sitting with me for this whole time because I feel like there's a prevalence of almost, uh, I would name it as maybe a spirit of comparison, especially in, well, in the world for sure, but I would say it's even prevalent in the church and Hmm. almost this pressure that we need to look a certain way or be a certain thing in order to fit in the category of what holiness Hmm. looks like. So being holy looks like this or that and doing these practices and having this temperament and the way that you engage with the world and that sort of thing. And mm-hmm. I know that, you know, there are standards like, you know, the fruits of the Holy Spirit and, and all of that, but I've just been getting so convicted lately and God's been stirring my heart on this subject of, you know, every person is carrying something so valuable and it's mm-hmm. distinct from every other person. And the more we try to shift ourselves or adapt ourselves to look holy or look Mm -hmm. in a certain way, the more we are robbing the world of that aspect of God's glory. And the story that kind of kickstarted this whole sequence for me was I read uh, something on social media about a man who they discovered that his blood Mm. produces antibodies to a particular disease that is actually fatal to babies when they're in the womb. And so I don't remember the full story, but basically they discovered he was in like a blood draw or in just a regular medical exam. They took some of his blood and they discovered that, you know, they didn't have a cure for this disease. And then they saw in his blood that he was naturally producing the antibodies and they were able to use his blood to create, I don't know if it was a vaccine or or something. And he ended up donating his blood, I think once a week for Mm -hmm. like 62 years or something like that. Just ridiculous. And him doing that saved, I think, the lives of 2 million babies. So I I was chewing on that and it just blew me away because here's this man, just a normal human being. Mm -hmm. And then here's this problem in the world. And the last thing that we would ever think to do would be to examine the blood of an individual wow. in search of a solution to that problem. But wow. here is where God hid the solution to this particular problem. And yeah. I feel like that's such a representation of wow. the the way that God chose to invest himself in every person in humanity, that mm. he's hidden something of himself whether it's a facet of his glory or a solution to a problem or Mm. someone who carries an idea or a breakthrough. And if we really are going to address the issues that are in our world Mm. and we really want to see God's kingdom here on earth, there are treasures hiding in every Mm. individual that the world needs. Mm. And if we stifle who it is that God has authentically created us to be, we end up depriving the world of the thing that God put in us to bring a solution or to bring a manifestation of his presence. So this whole thing has just been really stirring me and it's framing a new aspect of the idea of unity, whether that's Christian Mm. unity or racial unity or Mm. what have you. And, you know, unity is not the same thing as uniformity. And Mm. I, I'm just having this appreciation on another level of why that's so important. 
Yeah, as you were talking, I was just kind of like thinking back to one of my favorite scriptures of that it says all of creation groans as it awaits the revelation of the children of God. Uh, yeah. And to me that just says yeah, that the creation is groaning. There are problems in the world. Yeah, and it's just what you're saying, like God has put those solutions in people and the and the need to I was almost going to say harvest, but that's not <laughs> that's not the most uh, delicate way of saying it, but to really mine like kind yeah. of mining for gold, mining mm. what's in people and giving them space to to develop that and discover that and doing that in a way that kind of steers towards solutions. Yeah. Yeah. I love what you said, make space for that, because that was another part of what I was contemplating. Like, mm. I think the challenge is it's uncomfortable to have a room of people that's so diverse that you look at someone and you're maybe not in agreement with them about everything. And so Mm -hmm. you kind of want to cut connection with them or you want to not associate with them because you're not in a hundred percent agreement on something, but we need to create space for people to grow into the fullness of who they are. And Mm -hmm. we actually need people to have differing opinions and Mm -hmm. to carry something different than the next person carries and the next person. Mm -hmm. You know, I get frustrated sometimes because I feel a pressure, whether that's coming from myself or from outside, pressure to do all the things well, to be everything as a Christian. Like I, I need to be just the right amount of contemplative and just the right amount of charismatic, but not too much because people think it's crazy. And I have to be, you know, strategic, but also full of heart and all this stuff. And I, you know, it, it took me a long time to, I guess, just embrace the permission to just be myself well and let Mm. other people carry something different. Mm. So, you know, when that comes to ministry and evangelizing and that sort of thing, I think it's important that there are people who are really good at evangelization, Mm -hmm. that, you know, they hit the streets and they talk to strangers and they deliver the gospel and that person is radically touched by the Lord. But then we need people who are prayer warriors, who can spend hours with the Lord in quiet and solitude or in convents or wherever. And those two people don't have to both do both of those things. And yeah. and we can draw from the strengths of one another. Like, I don't have to be Todd White, and I don't mm-hmm. have to be Mother Teresa, and I don't have to be all these other people who exemplify God in that particular facet. I get yeah. to represent him in the facet that I carry, and we get to tag team the endeavor of bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. Yeah. Um, I feel that pressure constantly. You know, I look around and I see the things that other people are doing and they're they're doing really beautiful things for the kingdom. And I start to say, oh man, maybe I should be doing that. Maybe I'm yeah. not doing that enough. And it, it starts to make me question and doubt mm-hmm. where I feel God has really steered me. Mm. And I think this is where it actually would be so valuable if we as a church had a default setting of celebrating one another and affirming one another and calling out the gold in one another because otherwise it does feel like competition. It just feels like, oh, that person's doing this better than I am or they're doing more than I am or, you know, rather than... And there's this like temptation to to make my pet project the thing that everybody should be doing. Yeah. You know, like I'm really passionate about the pro-life movement, so everybody should be. And I'm really passionate about the rosary so everybody should be pumping this and and you know there's there's room for us to have our lane our niche our Mm -hmm. you know the thing that we carry you know and it's so much present in theory in in the catholic world if you just look at the the diversity of religious orders yeah i met some trappist monks over the weekend Mm. and it was really interesting the context i met them in they attended a symposium that I was at on the disaffiliation of young Catholics. And it's just talking about looking at the trends, what are the contributing trends or contributors to the trend of young Catholics leaving the church or leaving the institutional yeah. church. But I was really curious when I met these Trappists because I was like, I asked them, do you have an apostolate outside of, you know, I know you live a life of cont- contemplation, but do you have an apostolate outside of that? Or is that your apostolate? And he yeah. said, you know, this priest's response was, no, that, that is our apostolate. And I was curious. I was like, 
what brings you here today? You know, if you're not engaged yeah. in young adult ministry, mm-hmm. what's the purpose of coming here today? It was just kind of curious to me. And he, he said that the abbot just thought it would be useful for them to know about it and to be aware of it. Wow. And I was I was so struck by that because there can be this idea that contemplatives are just removed from the world, yeah. blind to what's going on in the world and just happily living out their yeah. you know, pursuit of the Lord. But it, it really edified me to see that they want to know what is going on in the world mm. so that we can bring that into the, this apostolate of prayer. Mm. But they also don't feel the pressure to have to start running alpha or, yeah. you know, like they can address the same problem in the particular way that God has called them mm. to address it Yeah, through that, that ministry, that uh, apostolate of prayer. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we all would benefit from that just increasing, well, first, celebrating one another, but Mm -hmm. also increasing our awareness of what everyone around us is doing, what they're carrying, and not demand that they do something different or do all the things Mm -hmm. and not compare ourselves to them and say, oh, I'm not doing enough because I'm not doing what they're doing. Yeah. So kind of both directions. Yeah. But I know that you also are really passionate about applying this not just to the Catholic world, but to the broader Christian world. Yeah, for sure. I'm definitely passionate about Christian unity for that reason. You know, Jim, you and I have been exposing ourselves to other Christian streams through podcasts Mm -hmm. and and whatnot, books and everything for a number of years. And we've experienced so much growth and we've encountered God in so many beautiful ways Mm -hmm. through these other voices. And it breaks my heart to have the thought that I might never have gotten to glimpse or experience that dimension of God Mm -hmm. had I not entered the space of these other Christians or invited their voice to be part of my toolbox or library or or even gotten to know them through personal relationship. And even, you know, Pope Francis or JP2 who talked about Basically, we need to have new expressions Mm -hmm. of the church, new ardors, new vigor, new... Do you remember the... Yeah, so the clarion call for the new evangelization is new ardor, new methods, new expressions. Yeah. 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 And I feel like we have very few new expressions that are coming out of the Mm. Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I hate to say that. I do think the more people embrace the thing that they're uniquely carrying. I think we're going to see more expressions coming out. Mm -hmm. But I love seeing the expression of God that other denominations Mm -hmm. are carrying. And, you know, Jesus is coming back for a bride and not a bride who's broken and beat up and but like a glorious bride and it's a united bride and so christians have to be united Mm -hmm. as one in order for jesus to come back and experience his glorified bride and so i think part of that process in kind of hastening that or bringing it forward Mm -hmm. is learning to appreciate and honor and champion Mm -hmm. other denominations Mm -hmm. that are especially doing tremendous things for the Lord, tremendous works in bringing the kingdom and the gospel message because we need one another. Yeah. You know, it makes me think of even in the gospels when the disciples came to Jesus and they said, there are these other people who aren't part of our group who are casting out demons in, in your name. Like, we should go stop them. And she's like, don't stop them. (laughs) We're on the same team, even if they are looking a little different. And, you know, who knows if that wasn't the Lord glimpsing a little bit into the future and and seeing a divided church, which is Mm -hmm. not his desire or his intention, but telling us the way it's supposed to work. Mm. That it's not going to be the crumbling and falling apart of various denominations, but all Mm. of us rising together and coming together almost in this great crescendo. Like you said, the glorious bride, a great crescendo. And it's sort of like if we are all moving towards the Lord together, we can't help but move towards each other at the same time. Yeah, And I think I enjoy I really enjoy envisioning what's it going to look like someday when we're finally yeah. all united and what is what is the fulfillment of God's kingdom yeah. here on earth going to look like? This is my happy place. I love yeah. thinking about it. But I think that there's actually a very practical here and now component to that too. Like it's yeah. great to daydream about it, but it actually 
we have to do something to get there. Like, it's not going to just magically happen. And I think the steps forward mean we do the thing of giving ourselves and other people space to be who they are and get behind them in that. And give all of us permission to be who we are and to do that well and to just be members of a team who are each carrying and stewarding something really crucial to the success of you know a successful outcome yeah and also training ourselves to see one another as what treasure has God hidden in this person yeah what solution might be in their blood to the problem that we are facing in our lives, in the world, and whatever, mm-hmm. you know, to almost just cultivate this environment where we are all irreplaceable. Yeah, and to kind of extend that to the broader picture, what has God placed in the blood of this? of these other Christians, these other churches, mm. even these other streams and denominations? Yeah. It's actually John Paul II who said something to the effect of, acknowledging that a lot of the Protestant and evangelical world, that they have explored and unpacked certain treasures Mm. of our Christian heritage more deeply than even the Catholic experience. And so there's, there's even a suggestion that we actually need to look to them in our own development of doctrine, that as we continue to unpack and unfold, our own understanding of what it means to be Christians in the world, that we need to take into account that perspective because mm-hmm. they've touched on something that didn't get touched on in the Catholic experience. Wow. It's a, it's a bold statement, but if we're acknowledging that they as Christians are also temples of the Holy Spirit, mm. which is, yep. is absolutely true because we acknowledge their baptism, yep. they've received that gift of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit can't help but be drawing things out of them, mm. almost extracting new riches, mm. you know? And it, in a sense, it does come back down to the individual, yeah. you might say, because if there's something unique in every person mm-hmm. and the Holy Spirit's trying to draw that out of every every person, every Christian and every follower of Jesus, then wherever they are, if they're in the Lutheran church, if they're in this evangelical or charismatic stream or whatever, then the Holy Spirit's going to be exposing those treasures and those riches right where they're at. Mm, Yeah. I've daydreamed about the day that we as Catholics can wander in and out of other Mm. Christian churches Mm -hmm. without anything other than appreciation for what they carry, honor for what they're stewarding, And just a a sense of joy and celebration that you get to do this part and you're doing it really well. And I get to enjoy what you're doing really well. And then I'm going to be faithful to what it is that I'm carrying and doing really well, rather than viewing it as comparison or competition. Yeah. Or, oh, but they're missing something. So I can't give my approval or I can't even set foot in their church because they don't have the fullness or whatever. Yeah. I guess the other application of this is I've just been so convicted about the need, again, for just giving space for people to just be themselves. Mm. And, you know, some people are called to just quietly do the really not flashy, just very straightforward lives. And that's beautiful. But there are also people who are legitimately called to do big things. They are legitimately called to change the world. And I feel like in the Catholic world, those are the people who end up getting shamed or Mm. discouraged or boxed in because Mm -hmm. it's not humble, and that's in air quotes, Mm. it's not humble to think that greatly about yourself Mm -hmm. or to um, have ambitions that are that large. It's You're supposed to be more, well, whatever God wants to do through me. And I remember reading when I was in college, I read for the first time Abandonment to Divine Providence. Mm -hmm. And he said, there are some people in this world who have an extraordinary calling to do great things. Mm -hmm. And they know it. Whoever is reading this, you Mm -hmm. know what I'm talking about. And he said, it is disobedient for you to not Mm -hmm. honor that, to not pursue that call to greatness. Because if that's what God is calling you to, you have to abandon yourself to that route. And it's 
it's going to play yeah. out differently for you. It's going to look different for you than it is for the ordinary person. But whatever you are called to, yeah. you're called to be submitted to God and, and all of that. And I that really resonates with me because I feel like there's not a lot of space in the Catholic Church for people to really get big, yeah. for people to really be ambitious and to do huge. There's plenty of room in the business world and in the secular mm-hmm. world. And I think that's maybe why the Catholic world is, you know, a little bit wary of that because they Mm. think that it's a worldly pursuit. But history is changed by big people, by by people who are going after stuff, who are ambitious about stuff. And we need to be the world changers, the society shapers. Yeah. You know, as you're as you're talking about this, it reminds me of a an experience I had one time where I went to a conference and I, I went to get a cup of coffee. They had a little coffee stand and I noticed at the coffee stand that it was raising funds for this ministry. And so I asked the guy behind the counter, oh, what's this ministry? And he said, well, my wife and I, we just felt called to start opening up our home to people who have been released from jail. Whoa. And we want to help them start reintegrating into life. So we just help Mm -hmm. them. We give them a place to stay initially and food. And then we teach them life skills, help them get jobs and help them reintegrate into society. And this is something we just started doing out of our home. And we'll have anywhere from one to four people living with us at at a given time. And that was just something that they felt called by God to do and to start. And I'm like, that's amazing. That's beautiful. And in conversation, he just asked me, he's like, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a a youth minister in a Catholic church. And his response was, oh, I used to be Catholic. Mm -hmm. And I have encountered that scenario so many times where I am encountering people in the evangelical world Mm -hmm. who are being these evangelistic entrepreneurs who are doing great things for the Lord. And time and again, they're saying, I used to be Catholic. And the only thing that I can think of is, what did we do to lose them? Yeah. And I think that speaks to what you're saying about, yeah. are we really creating space yeah. for people to be big? Yeah. Is it encouraged? Is, it, is there room? Or if it doesn't fit in the boxes and the yeah. structures that we've set up within our parishes, we say, oh, well, we don't really know what to do with you here. Yeah. Can we support them? Like. Yeah. Can we champion these things instead of like, well, you're off on your own. Good luck, you know? Yeah. Or is it just viewed as competition to the other parish activities that are going on? Exactly. Thank you. So, yeah, I think that creating space on the one hand for people to explore is is one thing, but creating space for people to get big is another. Like you said, I think that's something we really need to take a serious look at is like, are we making that space for people. Thank you.